Welcome to the Lorecast, where we look into the lore and the stories by which we live. I'm Dr. Craig Chalkwist, and you can find us at chalkwist.com slash podcast and at a number of other online venues. By the time you hear this, I'll have turned 60. <laughs> and uh, I feel pretty good about it, actually. So I thought I would do a podcast on not just aging, but how strange it is to do in my country, the U.S., um, increasingly in other countries, too. But uh, I notice it more here. And um, I'll start with something that probably all of us have uh, heard people say. Um, I heard it not too long ago. Somebody had turned 70, I guess. And um, they said, well, I'm 70 years young. And uh, some people mean that as a joke. It's just a humorous way of saying I'm actually getting old. But some people use it as, I think, a defense against the experience of getting old. Because getting old is something that, by and large, we're often afraid to do in this country. And there are many reasons for that. And um, I can tell you, from, not only from my experience, but also caring for an elderly relative, two of them actually, my mom and my dad. My dad died some years ago. That uh, getting old without an adequate support system is... Um, at best difficult and at worst catastrophic. If my mom had not had a decent pension, she would have been in real trouble. And my dad really didn't have adequate care either. So um, a lot of people in the States are complaining that it's falling on us to do things that our inadequate systems are supposed to do and actually used to do. And, um, you, you know, you compare how the experience of aging is and caretaking in other countries, and you can immediately see why it's so different. So I won't dwell on that, but I did want to mention that uh, commonly in conversations about why do Americans fear aging, one of the things that comes up is uh, our fear of death and how, how we've tried to make death pretty and unobtrusive and all that. And, of course, that's part of it. Uh, years ago, somebody, I think a journalist, referred to Forest Lawn in Los Angeles as drive through death. <laughs> and the tendency has spread. When my dad died, I met with um, the mortician a couple of times and talked on the phone to him as well. And Because um, I, I really wanted to know what he did and what his philosophy was about it and how he held it. So... He realized pretty quickly that he didn't have to pretty up for me and that we could actually talk in some detail. And at one point, um, I asked him about his last name, which, if you wrote it out, it looks like Vigil. <laughs> but uh, it's pronounced Vigil. And I said, well, clearly you're in the right business. And he, and he said, oh, yeah, it's a family business, actually. We've been doing this for a while. And I told him, I think what you do is really important. All of this needs to be talked about and ritualized and made conscious, and I think it's great. As well as extremely painful when you lose somebody. And in my case, um, it was doubly painful because my dad died of vascular dementia, and it took him years to die. And at the end, he was in horrible mental and physical pain. So that isn't something I would wish on anybody. After he died, I was open, as I said, to the experience of what that transition is like. I've Lost a lot of relatives, both on my adoptive side and my birth side. All my grandparents are dead, for instance. But um, in this case, I noticed that there were aspects of it that um, that actually were kind of amusing. Like at, at the mortuary, there was a sign that was posted to keep people safe because the driveway had this little quirk in it. it, it, it you couldn't really see who was coming when you pulled in. And the sign said, pass with care. <laughs> I thought, yes, let's do that. So in any case, uh, part of our fear of aging is fear of death, perhaps. Um, I think it's actually deeper than that. I think it's fear of living. Especially when you've given big chunks of your life to institutions. It used to be the case when I was younger that, uh, although those days were dying fast, but the old model of... Um, you get employed by a large corporation, they take care of you, you retire and all that. It was already fading. 
And uh, I didn't stay with any of the people who've hired me. Um, that, that too is, reminds me of something that we fear about aging, which is the older you get, the sharper the regrets present themselves. The regrets as well as the periods of life where you could have been doing something more enjoyable and you didn't. So it seems to me that when we don't mourn that, when we don't think of lost opportunities and lost people and, you know, I wish I would have turned left instead of right at that big intersection I passed through years ago. If we don't sit with that, then aging becomes a much bigger deal. And then we start using it to ward off some of those old sorrows and regrets, which can be quite sharp and bitter. If I could, just to name one regret, if I could go back in time to myself when I was maybe 20, one of the pieces of advice I would give myself is don't think for a moment that becoming an employee for a large business is going to protect you from anything. Probably the opposite. I saw many layoffs in those years, um, survived all of them, but uh, in some ways that's hard in, hard in a different sense. Um, than the people who get let go, which, of course, is financially hard for them, psychologically, too. But uh, there was this, a round of layoffs when I worked at um, this very large real estate company as a technical writer, and I worked in a large room with about 100 desks, and every time I came in during the layoffs, a few more people were gone. There were no goodbyes. They got escorted out of the building early in the morning or told, when they left at night, this was the more common way. Um, you're done. Get your get your stuff, and um, and you can't come back into the building. Utterly humiliating and inhumane. And so, me and the uh, other people who were still there would come in every morning, and there would be more desks that were empty. And it came all the way down to me. <laughs> I was not the only person in the company. I mean, there was a lot of other people in field offices, but in that particular office, or that wing of the office, I should say, that big, um, that big room, I was, I was it. I was the last one. And uh, I got an email that day. This was quite a while ago. Email was new that said um, the layoffs are over. And I said, screw this. I'm going to quit. <laughs> so... That's a regret that I have, that I spent so much time at uh, corporations, schools, other kinds of businesses, when I could have just been developing my own work. So when especially younger people ask me, what are the kinds of jobs that we can have that give us some measure of security? I always say, well, there aren't any except the ones that you create yourselves. And even there, you got to hustle. <clears throat> the wonders of male fist capitalism. It always struck me that, um, in English anyway, job and job are spelled the same. So the big pieces of life we didn't live, I think that's part of our fear of death as we get older. And uh, I've got some of those too, which is why now I'm playing and creating as much as possible. And things that I didn't do in childhood so much, I'm now doing more of. Because I don't want to die with those regrets. When I was younger, I sketched a bit. Um, I was never even close to being as good as my mom thought I was, but um, I let it go for decades. Uh, I just stopped sketching around college and didn't pick it up again. And so about a year ago, I started and I was astonished at how good I was. <laughs> Not professionally good, but I drew things and could actually recognize them. So I picked that up again. I write science fiction and I draw my characters. It's fun. Spent a number of years not dancing because when I was younger, I felt um, insecure about how I looked. I don't anymore, so now I dance, and it's fun. Now, part of our fear of aging, too, I think, has to do with one of our cultural complexes, as the Jungians, especially Kimball and Singer, would say. Cultural complexes are those trauma points that affect most of the people in a given culture, things that we're blind to. And um, our culture is in a huge state of identification with the archetype of the hero, or the heroic, I should say. And uh, heroes have a hard time aging. You know, witness some of the shows and, and films that are coming out right now, 
So there's a new Indiana Jones film coming out with Harrison Ford, who's 80, and he's still playing an action hero. Why? <laughs> Why can't he play the guy who mentors somebody who comes after him, for instance? William Shatner says he's, he'd still like to play Kirk. God knows why. And, um, you know, Patrick Stewart, he just finished uh, three years of his show, Star Trek Picard. And uh, that Picard acknowledges that he's much older than he used to be. And, and the cast does, too. They're, they're really open about it. At one point, there's a joke about all the gray hair in the room. Um, these were people who were in middle age in the 80s, right? And um, so those of us who were fans of the show are glad to see him back. And uh, I especially like how the show ended, although there were some pieces at the end that didn't get picked up or explained. But in any case, um, what struck me as funny uh, was that, especially the character of Picard, he's still out there saving the galaxy. And um, I think he's in his 90s in the show. And he's got a partner named Laris, whose name is a pun on the Roman um, word Laris, which uh, in Roman mythology and culture, there used to be household gods who protect you, the Laris. And um, so she's uh, somebody with a pretty shadowy background and uh, very skilled at protection. <laughs> she looks out for Picard. Um, and so when he mentions at one point that he's going to go off on a mission, she goes, what? <laughs> and of course, his, his aging friend, Will Riker, says, well, I didn't think you should have retired from Starfleet to begin with. And, and because he's old, too. And um, so what I'm asking here is, uh, is the hero really the best we can do for old actors? Is that really the only role for them? I don't see the sage very often, aside from occasional figures like Mr. Miyagi. Um, where's the sage in all this? Uh, of any sex or gender, where are they? The sage, the mentor, the teacher, doing what old people do in many different cultures. They, they help get behind and support the, the next generations that are following them. I always worry when that doesn't happen. Um, one of the things I inquired about when I was still looking for jobs um, was, are, is there any mentoring going on in this corporation or school? Are the people at the top training their replacements? Because if they're not, there's something going on that's not good. So yes, let's have even more old people on the screen, but, um, but n let's not pinch them into a role that's really not a respectable one for people who are aging anymore. It's really not. It looks out of place at best and ridiculous at worst. I will say, though, that I thought it was a good move in Star Trek Picard when the show kind of gets handed off to a younger crew, and um, including Picard's uh, son, his younger son. Uh, that's, that's a good move. But then, you know, a few weeks after the show ended, Patrick Stewart was saying something about, and let's bring the crew back again. And I thought, let's not, okay? <laughs> Or if we do, let's bring them back as advisors and friends or whatever. Let's, let's let the younger people take over for a while. Experience is one of the ways that they can get to be a sage themselves. And uh, I think, too, um, part of the fear of getting older is uh, not just regrets, not just unlived life, not just fear of death. But there's these little losses that you sustain along the way, not... Only the big ones like friends and family who die, but <clears throat> things like, um, you know, I've always had really thick hair. Um, it's I get it from my birth mother, and uh, I noticed about a month ago that in the back where the crown of my hair is, it's getting thinner. <laughs> and the hair on my face is turning white. It's not even stopping at gray. And, um, you know, I earned that, actually. I, I'm not surprised it's doing that. And every now and then I'll see a picture of myself in my 30s or 40s. And at first it made me sad. Um, but as I sat with it and got used to it, I thought, um, you know, those were in many ways good years. There were difficulties too, just as there are now. But, um, but they're done. I'm on a different track now. 
I'm moving in a different direction. I feel stiffer now when I exercise than I did before. And uh, my eyesight isn't as good as it used to be, although it's still pretty good. The other day I was in the kitchen making something and uh, I bumped against a cup and it went over the edge of the counter and I snatched it out of the air before it went very far. And I thought, well, I still have really good reflexes. And then I reminded myself, but those two will pass. So we spend the first half of life or so accumulating things, accumulating, hopefully, insights and skills and um, different new complex aspects of our lives. And then you reach a point where you start to also shed things. You leave things behind. I was, uh, I was telling somebody that I don't remember things as well as I used to, which is a common thing you hear from people who are um, adding on the years. And uh, I really liked the reframe <laughs> that I got in response. They said, um, well, the reason for that, the deeper reason for that may be that your psyche is partaking more of the eternal world. <laughs> And I said, well, um, I'll take it. I noticed, too, that uh, I'm much less willing to waste time. Um, When you're in your 30s and 40s, it feels like there's just plenty of time available. But as you get older, that feeling goes away. And uh, I'm much less willing to waste time. And I'm much more apt to point it out when people are wasting my time. I can't remember her name, but there's a woman on Instagram who's famous for saying, ain't nobody got time for that. (laughs) Yeah, same here. I hear you. I'm not sitting in any more three-hour meetings to get nothing done at work. Call me when you make a decision. I notice, too, as I get older, that I'm getting better at seeing through bullshit. Um, I started consciously trying to develop that skill back in my early 30s. Because that was when I started working with men who were right out of jail or right out of prison. And you had to be a sort of lie detector. And the guy who trained me knew that. And so I got really good training. But my ability to do that has been sporadic. Um, It doesn't work at all if you're not on your guard. And so what I've noticed is as I get older, uh, I'm more discerning. I'm less apt to trust people. And there's a circle of people who are close to me that I utterly trust. But I think I'm getting better at not falling into the extremes of cynical distrust on the one hand and foolish openness on the other. So that's kind of nice. Also, um, I don't worry about stuff as much. I think, uh, you know, I'm going to go to bed tonight and tomorrow the sun will rise. I notice too as I get older, I'm more and more intrigued by this archetypal figure of the sage. A figure who appears in all cultures. And in my culture, we get no training in how to be a sage, none whatsoever that I've been able to find. So I'm working on um, getting to know this figure better and thinking about the pursuit of wisdom in general and what it means to me. It's something that's preoccupied me for a long time. But uh, maybe I'll do a little bit of sharing what I learn about this figure of the sage. One of the qualities of this figure that... I like very much is the attachment not in the sense of indifference because that's just the defense but more in the sense of a kind of philosophical realization that life is change and that things will move on with or without me uh, eventually without me and tomorrow is a new day and maybe 10 years from now when I'm 70 I'll listen to this podcast perhaps and think Oh, to be 60 again. Thank you.